I'm very pleased to be here this morning and I'm very grateful you and for the invitation uh, to come along and, and share some views. So <clears throat> given I only have 22 minutes apparently, I have to focus on some fairly high level issues and I want to just give you some kind of broad food for thought rather than going into um, excruciating detail. And uh, of course, I, I have to admit starting off that I uh, started my involvement looking at, at the world of oil supply as a kind of naive geologist, thinking that it was all about porosity and permeability and sedimentary systems and all the rest of it. But actually it's far more complicated than that. And <clears throat> when we think about <clears throat> oil supply, <clears throat> we also have to think very carefully about the situation as far as demand is concerned in terms of its current position and evolution. And we also have to think about oil prices and how they evolve because they have a major factor, a major uh, a control over the future of supply. So there's a kind of basic cycle that, that we go through, uh, <clears throat> which we've probably just been through over the last 10 years in terms of limited supply, very high growth of demand in China, driving very high prices that in my time in the mainstream industry we would never have expected to come to pass. That's driven a lot of very um, substantial innovation and investment. The industry is now spending this year, we anticipate about $1.3 trillion on uh, upstream activity, and that's going to grow to about 1.6 over the next, next four or five years. And it's essentially quadrupled over the last 10 years. And of course, high oil prices uh, have an impact on demand, drive us to going into more complicated, higher price, harsh environments, and ultimately drives uh, lower oil prices and so on and so on. Um, I think we've also got to be a little bit careful about simply thinking about the resource base. You know, those of us who have calculated the resources of an individual well-defined field in the North Sea know what a, a kind of black art that is. So I think making pronouncements about the future of supply based purely on a view of of the reserves base is a little bit dangerous. And the other thing is that we should not think simply about conventional oil. Uh, these days we have to include the unconventional component that you'll hear about um, this afternoon. But in fact, what we're seeing and what has actually happened over the last few years is a, actually quite a significant improvement in the resource base globally. So that we have probably of the order of, of four and a half, five trillion barrels of 2P resources. We do have a finite resource, but we still don't know exactly what that finite resource is with any significant confidence. So we have to be a little bit careful with that. <clears throat> I just also want to make the point that if we can improve recovery rates by around about 1%, which seems highly feasible in certain areas, we could add 162 billion barrels or so to the global inventory. And that's about four or five years production on an annual basis. Of course, we hear this point that we're not discovering as much as we're uh, producing in, in every year. This is looking at purely uh, conventional oil. Uh, that is true of the 30 odd billion barrels that we are discovering every, uh, using every year. We are probably discovering about 12. Uh, what is usually forgotten, and it's the little point at the bottom of the slide, that this doesn't include resources uh, acquired from field growth. And what we uh, have seen is that over the last few years, the additions to the resource base of existing fields has actually made up that difference in terms of the shortfall uh, against, uh, against, uh, against production. So um, there's, there's another kind of geological point. The other thing is about technology. Uh, somebody described it as the kind of magic bunny. Everybody talks about technologies and isn't that specific. The question is, Will technology continue to bail us out? Uh, maybe that's not quite the right term, but we've got over 100 years of, uh, of history in terms of sophisticated technologies being developed and actually quite simple technologies being applied to exploration and production that have caused the needle to move quite dramatically. And more recently, we've seen horizontal drilling and fracking techniques used to transform our ability to basically develop tight reservoirs, and, and it's not rocket science. So I would say that we will continue to see uh, technological advances. I can't say what they will be. I think if I was to stand here and say there will be no more medical advances, 
in pharm pharmaceuticals, for example, there were no more advances in electronics. You wouldn't take me too seriously. Uh, I, I, I don't think there's really any difference here in terms of our ability to innovate, especially if you take a view that long term the oil price is going to continue to rise for, uh, for the re reasons we're all uh, very well aware of. The other thing I want to do is to uh, talk about uh, unconventional resources versus conventional. And I think we, we need to kind of pass the point of, of subdividing them. They're all part of a continuum. The petroleum engineers among you here will realize that the x-axis is actually viscosity, so that we've got high viscosity oils in the mining and SAG D, the oil sands and tar sands uh, environment that they know about. Uh, near the origin, we've got uh, what we call conventional oil, where uh, we have light crudes, generally speaking, uh, being produced from porous and permeable rocks. As we go up the y-axis, permeability actually decreases dramatically, and we end up with tight shales at the top. And there's a little box up in there which would encompass shale gas and uh, tight oil, but there's a whole continuum in between uh, from more traditional to these unconventional components, which in a sense we haven't quite touched on. Ro Roger mentioned somebody has 138 uh, uh, mil bi uh, billion, billion, billion barrels of resources in kind of uh, fields that have been discovered that, in, that, that are fallow, where there's presumably an issue around reservoir or, or, or how these things would be, would be developed. And they're, they're somewhere halfway up that axis. So we have to look at the whole picture to, to think about this. Um, we know that um, supply, demand and price you know, work together to incentivize investment. The industry has become uh, significantly more efficient in, e even in these times of very high oil price. And I remember uh, when I worked uh, in the North Sea when the prices were actually very low in the late 80s, there was a similar focus on efficiency there. So this is something that industry is uh, very, very, very used to, uh, to dealing with. So the tight oil revolution that we've seen is really a response, uh, a supply response to the relatively tight balance and the increase in the price that we've seen. And uh, we've also seen uh, technologies open, new technologies open up the, the pre-salt environment, particularly in Brazil, which is a major uh, uh, new play uh, opened up. And actually, just e even in terms of, of deep water. Um, but of course, the deep water um, gets great emphasis and it's very important, but out of the 90 million barrels a day that are produced at the moment, something like only six are produced from deep water. It's not, it's not kind of transformational, but it's very important. But it's an illustration that the kind of portfolio of, of opportunities that the industry is exploiting is kind of expanding uh, into, into different areas. And of course, wrapped up in all this is, is one of the themes of the conference around the future use of, of oil and the, the competition from other sources in the short term, probably particularly gas, and in the longer term, uh, ele uh, electricity. Did, press stop? Did I? Sorry. There we are. So also, we, we, we have to be careful as, 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 uh, as analysts and uh, predictors of the future because it's very dangerous to take historical data and blindly extrapolate it forward. We don't necessarily know what the new plays of the future will be. Uh, uh, we've seen some dramatic uh, uh, discoveries over the last 10 years or so, and I've, I've made a very uh, short list there of, of what's been happening, not only in, in kind of remote and, and harsh environments, but even here in the North Sea, there's been a, a giant field discovered in an area that we thought we understood very well. So we, we may see more of that going forward as, as understanding of basins improves and seismic, seismic uh, imaging improves. And then, of course, there's the tight oil uh, uh, component in that. So, you know, who knows uh, over the next 10 years exactly where some of those transformational components will build into the equation uh, going forward. Um, we keep hearing about easy oil has been found, and it's only the expensive oil that we're now looking at. Well, actually, uh, that's not necessarily the case. Um, of course, we're, the, the, the conventional wisdom seems to be that we're, we're finding oil at the, at the marginal cost of the barrel. It's getting more difficult than all the rest of it. That is correct, but there's also still a huge amount of oil to be 
uh, found and added to the resource base in some of the very uh, conventional type environments that we're used to. Uh, the 1% increase, for example, in, in, in recovery factor could be you know, very much dominated in, in the onshore environment that I've got there. So we need to be careful about the easy oil, difficult oil bit, because of course in 1970, when the North Sea was opening up, we thought that was very much the frontier, and it was. Uh, extremely difficult in terms of uh, you know, some of the deepest water we'd ever operated in. The technology to actually extract the oil and gas then was, was, uh, was groundbreaking. But now it's kind of run of the mill. It's actually pretty straightforward. So it's, it's, we're always at the frontier in a sense as we, as we move. I want to say a little bit about demand. And um, this is a very important part of the equation because for every barrel I can reduce demand. It's a barrel I don't need to bring to the equation. Okay? And this is an important concept from the perspective of, of what we heard in the, in the keynote speech uh, earlier on. But we have seen some changes in, in behaviour uh, over the last few years. We've seen that OECD demand has actually started to decrease from around about uh, 2006. We've seen a, a, a dramatic increase in, in fuel efficiency. And we've seen also an improvement in the, the energy efficiency overall in terms of, of GDP per barrel used that I'll show you in a minute. Um, and of course, the, the big uh, arbitrage these days is thinking about how to, if you look at the bottom plot here, how we can use gas uh, in the equation going forward because it's significantly, more, significantly cheaper than oil on a, on a kind of BTU basis. And then you know, into the future in terms of you know, alternative transport mechanisms, whether it's electric and, and how that electricity is, is, uh, is produced, etc. I thought this was also a very interesting one in terms of tax take. Now, we talked about uh, carbon taxes this morning as a rather complicated uh, issue. Um, if we look on the plot on the right, we see the current US situation. Uh, the effective cost of a barrel of, of oil or, or of kerosene is about $140 or so, and the majority of that is in the oil price, $99. If we look at Europe, it's actually something like $400 a barrel. There's a huge tax take there, relatively speaking. And, and for the, for the, if we took the US fiscal regime and applied it to Europe, uh, the oil price would be something like $284 a barrel. So, you know, it's all, it's all kind of relative, you know, in, in, in the, the OECD, we are using you know, effectively extremely expensive products in other parts of the world where often there's a lot of oil supply. There are lots of subsidies which, uh, which are uh, 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 imposed and, and available. So this is something that I think is, is worth thinking about when we think about the kind of demand equation. And then, you know, harking back to the earlier talk, you know, what is this tax revenue used for uh, in terms of um, investing in, in carbon capture and all the rest of it? I talked about the, the GDP, uh, um, well, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a plot that looks at the, um, at the efficiency of how we use the barrel. In 1970, it took $75 worth of crude to produce $1,000 of global economic output um, following the, the collapse of the oil price in, in the late 80s. And actually, the high oil price of the early 80s, there was a huge improvement in the efficiency, which was sustained through the early 2000s. I guess we got a bit complacent then, and in parallel with the price going up, we got less efficient, but I think that curve is now beginning to uh, turn down again uh, going forward. So we'll probably get back to the levels of the, of the 1995-200 uh, period uh, uh, pretty soon. The other point on the demand side is this is a plot of per capita, capita consumption in, in barrels against per capita GDP of some OECD countries and non-OECD countries. And you will see that uh, once we get to around about fifteen or $20,000 per capita GDP, uh, we're getting to individual consumption of 20 to 25 barrels per head per year in some of the developed countries. You can see that China and India are very much in the early part of that journey. And the question that entered my head was, uh, will we end up seeing a profile for China and India, etc., looking similar to some of these other developed e economies? And it's, frankly, it's just not possible. Even if we had 
the level of resource to be able to do that, uh, the amount of investment and the, the amount of time it would take to expand um, uh, supply to meet these levels of demand uh, just is, is, uh, is, not, is not possible. So when we in IHS think about our broad supply model, we try and look at many of these kind of above ground drivers of where we think things are headed and we have various scenarios uh, for the future. Um, of course, I, I've touched on subsurface issues. Um, the other thing that's really important is some of the above ground risks that impact the supply curve. Uh, one of the key elements is, is uh, geopolitics. It's very difficult to often see around the corner and, and predict the impact of geopolitics. The Arab Spring took us by surprise. The, the, the aftermath of the Libyan situation was very surprising because supply rebounded really extremely quickly to you know, near revolutionary uh, levels, which was a very positive thing uh, for the Libyans. Um, so there's a forecasting issue in terms of how we build those into the, the, the supply. As the volume of supply uh, overall increases, it becomes increasingly difficult to replace. Uh, we have a background de decline rate of probably about 4% uh, globally, and we've been growing supply at more recently about 1%, uh, 1.5% in the last decade. And so we have, when we're on the pedal cycle, we have to pedal pretty fast to actually uh, drive the levels of growth that we need to support the kind of economy that we've got at the moment, never mind if it's booming, uh, for example. So we, we need to be a little bit careful about that one. Um, and then the, the transition to alternative fields is not going to be uh, an overnight event. This is going to take a number of decades, and I think we'll probably discuss that over the next uh, couple of days. And I would, uh, I've put this in very bold lettering, we, we can't predict the future accurately. As I say, we have a number of scenarios of the future, um, which uh, it, this is just one of them. This is kind of our base case. Uh, we, have, we have essentially two end members and a base case. The end members are, we're not living in a world of continually increasing supply into the future. That just is not physically possible. Uh, also, we are not at the situation where supply is about to peak and irrevocably plummet, uh, except in certain unique circumstances. Um, if we had uh, a, a dramatic meltdown in, in geopolitical situation in certain key areas, which was sustained, or we actually took some pretty serious action on the climate change issue, um, I, I don't think we'll see a, a peak as such in the short term, you know, based on broadly the status quo. Um, also, uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, shows the, we go into huge detail, we've got four or 5,000 fields in this outlook, we take decline rates uh, into account, we look at fields in production, those under development, under appraisal, and we, we, we take a view of, of yet to find uh, when we build this model. There's always been this little kind of bulge ahead of the curve. We always see in the short term some very strong growth, and then when it comes to pass, it's pretty much on the historical trend. And then when we go 10 years out, and I see this in, in many outlooks, it kind of flattens off a little bit. I think what this represents is the fact that we know a great deal about what, what companies are, are developing at the moment. We know a lot about the fields that they're investing in. We know what the potential of those fields is. We don't quite get the timing right. We don't quite get the impact of geopolitics right or the global economy right on that. So I think as a little signpost to problems in the future, in, in, in our case anyway, the minute we start seeing that little bulge flattening out and we see the inventory of, of opportunities uh, in terms of investment for the industry, we'll, we'll start to think that there may be some resource constraint uh, starting to kick in, which can cause problems in terms of the future curve. But certainly in the 10 years I've been doing this, the bulge has always been there. Um, this is a, something I did in the mid-2000s, in the mid -2000s, um, and really just is a, is a, a schematic to show that uh, we think that in, in, in the nearish term, you know, we can't put a specific date on it, uh, supply will, will, you know, can continue to grow based on the inventory of opportunities there and our view of the potential and, and what we think uh, companies and governments are capable of doing. Uh, we think that there'll be a kind of undulating plateau of supply 
over a period where there'll be a lot of volatility. This will be a fairly long protracted period where we're working on bringing some of these other sources of, of transport energies uh, to the fore. And then eventually the, the resource constraint will start to kick in and the curve will start to turn down. So we have some time to make some decisions and take some action, but it's, it's not centuries. Um, and then just to uh, uh, kind of recap on, on, on two or three kind of key issues, um, future supply is, is not just about geology and, and resources. Uh, oil prices obviously have a, an, an important impact on uh, investment levels as we've seen in the last few years and, and have a very big impact on, on innovation and our ability to develop uh, technology and, and make a difference. And actually very important have an impact on, on behaviour. And you know, we see that uh, very commonly when the oil price was in its very volatile stage three or four years ago. You could see you know, the number of cars on the road actually dropping a little bit as, as a result of that. So there's quite a lot of sensitivity in, in the marketplace uh, uh, around price. Uh, we, we, uh, let, let's just think, uh, we, we're not sure what the innovations are, uh, but we, as I say, we think they'll, they'll continue. And then, of course, I believe that we've actually still only produced a, a subordinate proportion of the total resource base, which we can potentially uh, extract. It uh, doesn't mean to say that what is left is going to be easy to extract or we're going to do it uh, cheaply, uh, but we're already paying a high price for oil. Um, and uh, there, 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 there's a lot of scope to continue to grow the curve. But we, we must not underestimate the... The, the challenge that the industry has to uh, find and develop new sources of oil and gas, both uh, conventional and unconventional. I am not trying to give you a, a sort of strong rosy picture. Professor Kemp asked me for the, the executive summary of this talk at coffee time and I said, well, I'm pretty bullish about the potential for the future uh, supply curve, but it's actually not going to be that straightforward. It's going to be pretty difficult because there's a whole range of below ground and above ground uh, factors which are actually going to drive the equation. So I'll stop there and thank you and I'm very much looking forward to hearing comments from other uh, speakers uh, later in the day.